Gandalf is a beloved character in the Lords of the Rings universe and there are many reasons for that. One might be that mentor characters are always quite popular in hero's journeys. But further there's also some mystery surrounding Gandalf and Tolkien was very good at building up some mysteries but at the same time also tying up loose ends very often. But not always. Sometimes Tolkien left some elements deliberately uncovered in the book as mysteries, as enigmas like Tom Bombadil or the mysterious order of the wizards, the e-study, those who know. I think especially if you only have seen the films you would not get the idea that those wizards are actually angelic beings in disguise. Though to be fair we definitely get some information in the Lord of the Rings book about the nature of the e-study, for example in Appendix B. However, you still have to look out for those. And as said, Tolkien was a master of using these little mysteries to make his world more interesting. A particular interesting line for that in context of the wizards is in the voice of Saruman. So when you read through the book, you at some point stumble upon the dialogue between Saruman and Gandalf in this chapter. And there Saruman says to Gandalf, Later, yes, when you also have the keys of Barad-dûr itself, I suppose, and the crowns of the seven kings and the rods of the five withers, and have purchased yourself a pair of boots many sizes larger than those that you wear now. And here the reader will always ask the question, wait, five withers? We only know about three of them, Gandalf, Saruman and Radagast. Who are the other two? And that readers of the book definitely ask themselves this particular question we can definitely see because Rona Bear wrote a letter to Tolkien 1958 and Tolkien answered her letter in letter 211 from the 14th of October 1958. And this is one of the few sources we have about these two particular wizards which we will discuss in this video today. My name is Chris aka The Philosopher's Games or TPH Games and today we look into the sources for the two blue withers. And we do this in this kind of new format here with a working title Law of Freestyle because I did not write a script for this. This has a benefit and the main intention of being able to produce this faster, the downside that it won't be potentially as long and not as in-depth as my scripted videos would be. Though it's not like that there won't be any scripted videos anymore on this channel. But this helps me to get back on track and people who know me will know that this is still pretty detailed. Also the hint and to those who know my channel here quite well, of course I already made a 70 minute long video about all the e-study including the blue withers, but that was some time ago and with nature of Middle Earth and so on we definitely got some additional information which I would like to include and discuss here in this one. Also, as you probably have noticed, I tried to pronounce names as Tolkien described it. Thank you to the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks today, especially Ted Naismith for his fantastic Blue Withers artwork and of course also Sara Morello, Kimberly 80, Jenny Dolphin and all the others. You find them linked in the description. And of course, spoiler warning. Talking about the two blue withers is actually not that easy because Tolkien wrote several different texts mentioning them at very different times and often those contradict each other completely. As a result I decided to go through all these sources in chronological order, in the chronological order Tolkien wrote it. And that gives us an idea how these two characters developed over time. Online you often only find, I would call it, interpretations of the two blue withers because people start combining all these different sources and texts Tolkien wrote about them and piecing them together in some way even though in other details these texts contradict each other. We have to keep in mind that at the end Tolkien never published a fully coherent text version for this himself. As a result we are just looking at work in progress text that Tolkien considered for publication or that Tolkien wanted to work into something that might be published someday. But 
this never happened and we are not talking. We can't decide what is canon. As a result, it's only your head canon. And especially people that reach a lot of people should be very careful with this because else the impression could easily occur that there is actually one final version that Tolkien wrote and answers all the questions. That is not the case. It is of course completely fine to have a headcanon on this particular matter. I would even say it's necessary, but it has to be treated as such and not as the canon version. It seems the first version where these two additional wizards appear is definitely the already mentioned quote from the chapter The Voice of Saruman in The Lord of the Rings, where Saruman accidentally reveals the information that there are five wizards. This was written at some point in 1942 or some of the following years roundabout. So in this time the two blue wizards were kind of invented. Interestingly, in this chapter also the Palantir was invented. Another passage that references this particular section in the book is of course in Appendix B. The appendices were written for the release of Return of the King and also written in the 50s. So a little bit later, but there we also find a quote. The two highest of this order, of whom it is said there were five, were called by the Eldar Kurunir, the Men of Skill, and Mithrandir, the Grey Pilgrim, but by men in the Norse Saruman and Gandalf. We also find a similar text that is potentially related in the Silmarillion in the chapter of the Rings of Power and the Third Age, which was to my knowledge also written in the 50s, though there we don't find the number and only the wording of these Kurunir was the eldest and came first and after him came Mithrandir and Radagast and others of the Istari who went into the east of Middle-earth and do not come into these tales. Here though we at least get a little bit of additional information in the form that we know that the other Istari went to the east of Middle-earth. With all this in mind, we have so far almost no information at all, only that there are two additional wizards and that they go east. However, this will change with the next text published in Unfinished Tales called the E-Study. It was written round about 1954. The story behind some of these texts in this chapter is quite interesting. Tolkien wanted to produce a special index with like elvish vocabulary and other notes and so on, as we for example know the index from the Silmarillion. Tolkien writes in a letter, letter 187 from 1956, an index of names was to be produced, which by etymological interpretation would provide quite a large elvish vocabulary. I worked at it for months and indexed the first two volumes. It was the chief cause of the delay of volume three until it became clear that size and cost were ruinous. So this was not published with volume three, which is Return of the King back in the day. It's interesting that it would be part of the Lord of Rings if this would have been greenlit by the publisher, which was not the case because they projected that the cost were so high for this that it would be ruinous to even try this. However, fortunately, Christopher Tolkien, Tolkien's son, published this posthumously in Unfinished Tales and I guess some other texts also, of course, in the History of Middle-earth book. So we have access to those texts today. The chapter, the E-Study, is of course composed of multiple texts or multiple text versions and also one very late text that isn't even from this time. But let us begin with the first one. I just read some sections out of this that are related to the Blue Withers. The first one reads as follows. The first to come was one of noble mien and bearing, with raven hair and a fair voice, and he was clad in white. Great skill he had in works of hand, and he was regarded by well nigh all, even by the Eldar, as the head of the order. Others were there also, two clad in sea blue, and one in earth and brown. And last came one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and in looks more aged, grey-haired and grey-clad, and leaning on a staff. And here we finally learn that the two unnamed withers are the blue withers, clad in sea blue. At the end of this text we find another interesting passage that reads, 
Of the blue, little was known in the west and they had no name save Ithrin Luin, the blue wizards, for they passed into the east with Kurunir, but they never returned and whether they remained in the east, pursuing there the purposes of which they were sent, or perished, or as some hold were ensnared by Sauron and became his servants, is not known, but none of these chances were impossible to be. In this text we now get the elvish Sindari name for blue wizards and also the information that they went east again, but here they add that they went with Saruman and they did not return to the west, but Saruman did as we find out in other texts and know from the Lord of the Rings of course. So they remained in the east. And now Tolkien gives us multiple outcomes for what might happen. Either they were kind of successful and um, pursued their purpose or they perished or they were even ensnared by Sauron and became his servants. It is interesting that Tolkien writes none of these chances were impossible. So he seems to be not sure what actually happens with these two blue wizards. Though he seems to have a tendency here because at the last option he says or as some hold were ensnared by Sauron. So this seems to be the more likely outcome. At least some people who know about them, which are not many, hold it true that they might have failed. And later in another text that Christopher Tolkien says belongs to this text, we can even read indeed of all the East study, one only remained faithful. And that is of course Gandalf. Of course, what I just read here are just very few passages in the whole text, which is a lot about Gandalf, Saruman, a little bit about Radagast, and especially about the nature of the wizards of the Istari. And there it is explained, and I should add this here very shortly. Maybe check my um, main video on the Istari here on this channel if you want to learn more about this in more detail. The Istari are Mayar that are kind of angels of lower rank in disguise. Tolkien describes them as being clad in flesh. They are just these spirit beings that are insanely powerful. And there are also the Valar, which are angels of highest rank, you could say, that form kind of a god pantheon and govern over the world of Arda. And the Mayar serve them. So each of these wizards, Istari or Mayar, serve a specific Vala and these are also later explained in the following text. There's even a table showing the connections here. And this is also a very important part of the metaphysical structure of Tolkien's world. We have the one Eru which is God and then his angels of highest rank that he sent to the world to Arda to govern it and form it. And of course they had their helpers, the Mayar, angels of lower rank. And at the end of the first age to fight the first Dark Lord Morgos, they came to Middle-earth in full force and they fought and big parts of Middle-earth were completely destroyed and sunk into the ocean. A lot of destruction was caused and this they wanted to avoid now in the second and especially third age. So they decided to try a more subtle approach this time. And so they held a council and asked very few Mayar to go on the secret mission. And those would clad in flesh, so be in disguise and not reveal their full nature and true power and try to kindle resistance against Sauron so that Sauron could be overcome out of the free peoples of Middle-earth itself without the Valar and Mayar coming and destroying everything again and causing huge chaos. And it must be clear that in all versions we can read the Istari are Mayar. There's not a single exception to this, even in Lord of the Rings and in all other texts this becomes pretty clear. And in the next text we find in the Istari um, section of Unfinished Tales, this council is actually described and this is the only source for this council. And this also includes kind of a mission description by Manwe, who is the king of the Valar, the king of the world, the elder king. Manwe asks, who would go, for they must be mighty, 
hears of Sauron, but must forgo might and clothe themselves in flesh, so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men. But this would imperil them, dimming their wisdom and knowledge, and confusing them with fears, cares, and rarenesses coming from the flesh. But only two came forward. Kuromo, that is Saruman, who was chosen by Aule, that is the Valar of Smithing, and Alatar, who was sent by Orome. Orome is the Valar of Hunting. So these powerful angelic spirit beings have to diminish themselves and take like a physical form that is also affected by fierce cares and wearinesses, as Tolkien writes here. And now the interesting part is that here, we have a name that we have not heard before, Alatar. And this is one of the blue withers. This is the first time we find a name of one of the blue withers. And later in the end of this text here, Christopher Tolkien summarizes the last note a little bit and he writes, the note ends with the statement that Kurumo, Saruman, took Iwendil, Radagast, because Yavanna, that is the Valar of nature, backed him and that Alatar took Palando as his friend. And here we have the name of the other blue with it. Kurumo is Saruman, Iwendil is Radagast, Olorin is Gandalf, and Alatar and Palando are the blue with it in this version here. Also, it must be noted that in these texts here and in the following sections and so on, we find notes on the etymology and of the origin of their names. And Kuromo, Olorin and Iwendil are their Quenya names from the West Continent, Aman. That is where these angelic beings live. And that is also in the Far West. That is where the elves later sail to at the end, for example, of the Lord of the Rings. That is the blessed realm, the undying lands, as they are often called. However, when these five selected Maiar sail over to Middle-earth and become the wizards there, they get new names by the local population because they never or rarely reveal their actual name. Gandalf, for example, reveals in The Lord of the Rings his name Olorin once to, for example, Faramir. But beyond that, it is not much known about them and only very few know about the actual nature of these Istari. One of them is definitely Círdan and also Elrond and Galadriel. So Radagast, Saruman and Gandalf, or Gandalf has also other names like Tharkun as the dwarves call him, or Mithrandir as the elves call him, and so on. These are their local names in Middle-earth, not their elvish Quenya names from the West continent. And interestingly, the local names of Alatar and Palando are not revealed. And they only have their elvish Quenya name, so the name as they are called on the West continent, for example, by the elves. The meaning of their names is not fully clear. Alatar could have to do something with radiance and Palando has the word Palan in it, which is Quenya and means far. So it could be the far one or the far. Interestingly, it is also part in the word Palantir, which means far seer or far sighted. However, in these notes, we also find this interesting mention table where we can see which of these Maiar serves which Valar. We have Olorin, that is Gandalf, he serves Manwe and Varda. Manwe is, as mentioned, the king of the Valar, and Varda is his wife and queen of stars. She is quite well known in the Lord of the Rings as well, because her Sindari name is Elbares. Then we have Kurumo, that is Saruman, he serves Aule, the mentioned Vala of Smithing. Then we have Iwendil, that is Radagast, he serves Yavanna, logically the Vala of nature. Interestingly, the wife of Aule. Alatar now serves Orome, and Palando also serves Orome. Orome is the Vala of hunting. Interestingly, we find with Palando the note that, but this replaces Palando to Mandos and Niena. Mandos is the doomsayer of the Valar, a very powerful one and he has to do with matters of death for example that's kind of his realm the halls of mandos is where the souls if you want to call the spirits of the dead go later hopefully 
and Nienna, the Valor of Pity and Mourning. In my opinion, a very underrated and extremely powerful Valor because in Tolkien's world, the concept of pity and mercy is connected to wisdom. And we can read about Gandalf that among the Maiar, he is the wisest or one of the wisest and he learned pity and mercy from Nienna. And I think this is deeply connected to the story of the Lord of the Rings. Think of in The Hobbit how Bilbo did not kill Gollum and has mercy on him. And Gandalf recognizes this and later tells Frodo no, he should not have killed Gollum because Gollum still has a greater part to play in the story. And he was right. But this is of course a different topic. Let us return to the blue with it. You might ask the question, why are both of them associated with Orome? And Christopher Tolkien has an interesting thought or speculation on this. He writes, it might be, though this is the merest guess, that Orome of all the Valar had the greatest knowledge of the further parts of Middle-earth and that the Blue Wizards were destined to journey in those regions and to remain there. Unfortunately, that is everything we can learn about the two Blue Wizards in the chapter The Istari in Unfinished Tales. I think the biggest information we can get out of this chapter is that the Blue Wizards have names Alatar and Palando, at least on the West Continent, and that both serve the Vala Orome. Further, that Alatar took Palando as a friend. So he took him with him as a friend, that's how I would read it. This kind of implies that they might travel together, while the others are often on their own. But this is not 100% clear or stated. There's in another source another hint in this direction, we come to this in a moment. Further, we can also read that they went east and that Kuromo, so Saruman, went with them for a while, but Kuromo returned to the northwest of Middle-earth, while the Blue Withers stayed in the east. And interestingly, it is not clear if they were successful, but Tolkien seems to tend into the direction that they were not, because we can read the line that only one of the East study remained faithful. And the option here that Tolkien gives is that they either perished or that they even became servants of Sauron. Though it is also possible that they tried to complete their mission, but ultimately failed at it. And now we jump into the year 1958 to an answer that Tolkien wrote in letter 211 to Rona Bear that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Tolkien answers a question, what were the colors of the two withers mentioned but not named in the book? Tolkien writes here, I doubt if they had distinctive colors. Distinction was only required in the case of the three who remained in the relatively small area of the Northwest. On the names see question 5. I really do not know anything clearly about the other two, since they do not concern the history of the Northwest. I think they went as emissaries to distant regions east and south, far out of Numenorean range, missionaries to enemy occupied lands as it were. What success they had, I do not know, but I fear that they failed, as Saruman did, though doubtless in different ways, and I suspect they were founders or beginners of secret cults and magic traditions that outlasted the fall of Sauron. This is an extremely surprising answer after all we just discussed and you have to consider the chronology is the other text, the Istari texts are from 1954, so were written four years earlier. And this is now in the year 1958. So it seems Tolkien was relatively unsure of what he wanted to do with these two blue withers and he kind of reflects this. Some information we also get here, like that they went east, but now it's expanded by they also went south, far out of Numenorean range. And they also are not successful here. He fears that they failed, as Saruman did. But here he expands this by saying they were founders or beginners of secret cults and magic traditions that outlasted the fall of Sauron, which is a very interesting line in my opinion. However, we also know that the two wizards had distinctive colors, which was the color blue, though maybe what he means here is that both of them had of course the same color and 
in their mission and their big region that they had to cover, there was no need for them to have distinctive colors anyway. I can think of like two different ways to understand or interpret why Tolkien has worded this letter like this. One would be that Tolkien was still working on this in the background and maybe considering it for publication in another book, like a later publication of the Silmarillion, which of course never happened in his lifetime, unfortunately. And he did not want to reveal too much here yet, but at least he revealed a little bit, which is of course very nice of him, I think. Another interpretation would be that Tolkien was not happy with what he was working on in the background so far and was still in the process of changing it. So saying, hmm, I don't actually know what was going on there exactly is the truth because he was still in the process of thinking of something new. And with this there's also a third option, which I think is the most likely one. It's a mixture of both. However, I think the most interesting line is still that they are founders of secret cults and magic traditions. That is very interesting, especially in the context that they outlasted the fall of Sauron. So we know that there are cults and potentially magic traditions in Tolkien's world and we even know that he at some point started writing a sequel to Lord of the Rings, which he abandoned later, which also mentions cults. So he could have maybe thought something into this direction that there is an explanation, an origin story for where do these skulls and magic traditions come from when Sauron isn't there anymore to teach men how this stuff works and the failed blue wizards as immortal beings are kind of the origin of this. And depending on when or how early these cults were founded, it might be also an explanation for other mentions of magic traditions in Tolkien's world before the Lord of the Rings. Think of the necromancer and how the White Council was quite hesitant to act there. Though of course the main reason is Saruman blocked the action to search for the ring himself. But I kind of like the idea that Tolkien uses this mystery about these two unnamed wizards to kind of give an answer to other mysteries. And now if we jump to the next text from 1959, we find something very unusual and was only published in one of the newer books, The Nature of Middle-earth. We can read in the chapter key dates, the Valar sent five guardians, great spirits of the Maiar, with Melian, the only woman but the chief, these make six. The others were Tarindor, later Saruman, Ulorin, Gandalf, Ravandil, Radagast, Palakendo and Hymenar. These five guardians of the Valar are a big surprise and we have never heard of this concept in any text until Nature of Middle-earth came out. And also some of these names like Tarindor for Saruman, I've never heard this name before and even the name Ravandil and Palakendo and Hymenar also appear nowhere else to my knowledge. Only Olorin is the only name we are familiar with and of course Melian. We know her from the Silmarillion, she plays an important role there, a very powerful and wise Maya, powerful when it comes to enchantment and she is the mother of Luthien, also a very important elf in the law of the Lord of the Rings. These five guardians existed in the context of the so-called great journey of the elves. See my video about the history of the elves from Círdan's perspective, for example. Though keep in mind when I made this video, the book Nature of Middle-earth was not even out yet. So this guardian's part is not included there, but at least it gives you an overview what the great journey is exactly. But the elves awoke once in Middle-earth at a bay called Cuivienen and there they were under the influence of the first Dark Lord Morgos or Melkor as he still was called at this time. He is also one of the Valar interestingly but an evil one. But the good Valar wanted to protect the elves and invited them to live with them on the west continent. And so the elves decided for the most part, not all of them, to follow this invitation and journey west. So they went to the west coast and had to be brought over the ocean. And during this great journey, it seems they were protected for the most part by great spirits of the Maiar in the form of Melian and those who would later potentially become the Istari. However, it's not clear if 
Palakendo and Hymenar are actually the two blue wizards, but with having Radagast, Gandalf and Saruman in the mix, it is very likely to assume that this is the case. And this also later kind of makes then more sense why exactly those five were selected for the mission. Melian, of course, is a special case here in this context. And her being present here as one of the six guardians makes complete sense because she has to meet the elf Elwe and fall in love with him. Very interesting to see these names that are nowhere else recorded as even the editor of Nature of Middle-earth, Mr. Hostetter, mentions here. He would translate Palakendo with Farsighted One and Hymenar with Farfarer. Now, should these last two names be the blue with it, then we have another little piece of history for them, that they were once on Middle-earth and helped the elves on the great journey. It is also interesting that Tolkien changed their names again and same with Saruman and Radagast as well. Radagast was Iwendil before instead of Ravandil and Tarindor was before Kuromo. And now we make a very big jump in time for the next text which was written around about 1970 to 1972. So very shortly before Tolkien died in 1973. In Peoples of Middle-earth we find a text called The Five With It. This text is referenced in another text from this time and I assume potentially written a bit later than this one here. There is a collection of several texts from this time that are considered Tolkien's very late writings. We come to this other text that was also only published in Nature of Middle-earth. In a moment let us start with a text, the first text from Peoples of Middle-earth called The Five With It. The other two came much earlier, at the same time probably as Glorfindel, when matters became very dangerous in the Second Age. Glorfindel was sent to aid Elrond and was, though not yet set, preeminent in the war in Eriador. But the other two, Istadi, were sent for a different purpose. Morinechtar and Romestamo, Darkness Slayer and East Helper. The task was to circumvent Sauron, to bring help to the few tribes of men that had rebelled from Melkor worship, to steer up rebellion and after his first fall to search out his hiding in which they failed and to cause dissension and disarray among the Dark East. They must have had very great influence on the history of the Second Age and Third Age in weakening and disarraying the forces of East, who would both in the Second Age and Third Age otherwise have outnumbered the West. This text now, as you can see, goes in a completely different direction in many places, but of course also keeps some themes and ideas intact. What is very interesting and what I did not mention before is when the Istari arrived in Middle-earth, including the Blue Withers. In all the other versions, they arrived in the year round about 1000 of the Third Age, so somewhere in this area. In this text now, the Blue Withers arrive with Glorfindel in the Second Age. Previously it was also not clear when Glorfindel actually arrived, so we get the answer here. And there is another text called Glorfindel in which Tolkien explains that Glorfindel arrives maybe as early as 1200, but most likely 1600 in the Second Age. And that is exactly the time when the One Ring was forged. So that is a very important historic moment in time. In one of the texts we discussed earlier in the Unfinished Tales chapter, the E-Study from 1954, we can read that those E-Study arrived in the time of important historic events, which is very interesting that Tolkien expanded a little bit on this and moved the time around. The order was always that they did not come to Middle-earth at the same time. First was maybe Saruman, the Blue Withers, and last was potentially Gandalf with Radagast. So it is interesting to see that now the order is completely changed and the Blue Withers appear first in the Second Age, Saruman also comes to Middle-earth only in the Third Age, same as Gandalf and Radagast. Their date of arrival is not changed here. 
So a lot of things have now changed in this text. They don't arrive in the third age anymore, but in the second age, as said. And they also have new names. Now they are called Morinechtar and Romestamo, Darkness Slayer and East Helper, and not Alatar and Palando. Don't try to connect Morinechtar to Palando or Alatar and vice versa. It is not clear. These are just two names that Tolkien dropped here in whatever order. We don't know if they are still associated with Orome or not, if that is the same name. They also had Palakendo and Hymenar as um, another name and these new names are also nowhere else to be found and are just existing in this particular section. It's not even clear if they are still part of this whole six guardians concept during the great journey of the elves or not. This is not mentioned here in this text in any shape or form and maybe Tolkien abandoned this idea or not. It is impossible to say. We only know that he changed the name of these two blue wizards again. And another very big change is that they are now successful and also part of their mission is revealed that their task was to circumvent Sauron to bring help to the few tribes of men that had rebelled from Melkor worship. We know that Morgos, or Melkor as he was called in his early days, was very active in the east and potentially also the south, but especially the east. And also Sauron always had very good ties to the eastern regions. Think of the Easterlings that helped Sauron in his wars and so on. So this was always a thing. And in this area, they managed to cause dissension and disarray. And they helped ultimately in disarraying the forces of the east who would both in the second age and third age otherwise have outnumbered the west. So the forces that would have helped Sauron would have been in much larger numbers otherwise and this would have definitely been bad news for the free peoples of Middle Earth in the west. So here in this version they are largely successful and this completely contradicts the line that only one state faithful to his mission that we find in the version from 1954. And as a result it becomes very difficult to start combining those texts if they go in completely different directions. Another very interesting addition to this is the line that after Sauron's first fall, the two blue wizards start to search for Sauron's hiding, I assume, in the far east, in which they failed, unfortunately. And this is only possible because now the blue wizards already arrive in the second age and that is also when Sauron's first fall is. You remember the big battle of the last alliance of elves and men against the forces of Sauron. At the end of that they besiege Barad-dûr for seven years and then Sauron at some point has to come out and fight himself. And here he kills Elendil and Gilgalad though is overthrown in this epic battle himself. And then Isildur is able to just cut off the finger with the one ring using the hill chart of Narsil. One might argue that his body being destroyed in the downfall of Númenor might also be considered his first fall, but I think this was more a victory because he destroyed one of his most powerful enemies, escaped and kept the One Ring, though from that point on he could never take a fair form again. But I think that was just a small price to pay for him. Interestingly, this text was already hinted at in Unfinished Tales in the chapter The Easterdy, but Christopher Tolkien wrote back in the day that he could simply not read this, because Tolkien's handwriting is quite infamous. As a result we find for example one question mark in this text where Christopher Tolkien was not sure if this is really written there and sometimes also three dots where it seems maybe there's a word missing or um, had to be left out because he did not know what was written there exactly. It is not clear though if he omitted the south which was mentioned in the letter east and south if you remember. So we only find the east here and we also notice that one of the two blue with it is called east helper not south helper. So from my perspective it's difficult to say if the two blue with it also went into the south or only into the east. The description of their mission though kind of hints more towards the east in my opinion because one of the parts is the mentioned finding um, of Sauron's hiding and he always hid in the east. 
it is of course possible that one of them or even both of them went to the south at some point though it is not directly stated here in this text as said it could be omitted or just be in the realm of the possible however what we definitely know is that both of them were active in the east Though to be fair, it's always a bit difficult to tell what the exact definition of South in what context is, to be honest. For example, in the chapter The East Study in Unfinished Tales, there's also a discussion about the origin of one of Gandalf's names, in this case Incanus, or potentially pronounced Incanus. And if this name in its origin is a name from Harad, Faharad, or even only South Gondor. As a result, it's not clear how far South Gandalf was in his lifetime and if he potentially even could have met the Blue Wizards there. And we can also read about Gandalf that he did not went east, so at least not past Mordor. And this brings us now to the last text I already mentioned that is published in the Nature of Middle-earth called Note on the Delay of Gilgalad and the Numenorians, which was potentially even written after the Five Wizards text. So it's from the 70s. And this is discussing potential problems that Sauron might have had and also Gilgalad and the Numenorians during the time of the War of Elves and Sauron in the Second Age. And here we can read about Sauron and he misjudged this as we see in his final defeat when the great host of Minas Tir from Numinor landed in Middle-earth. His gathering of armies had not been unopposed and his success had been much less than his hope. But this is a matter spoken of in the notes on the five wizards. He had powerful enemies behind his back, the east and in the southern lands, which he had not yet given sufficient thought. The line, his gathering of armies had not been unopposed, ties perfectly into the Five Wizards text, because there, in the east, the Blue Wizards are active and causing dissension and disarray, and so on, even in the Second Age, and this text here is about the Second Age. So of course, it is true that he had powerful enemies behind his back in the east. However, some people now interpret the line and in the southern lands to which he had not yet given sufficient thought. In a way that the blue wizards are also active in the south, which is completely possible. But it is not the only possible interpretation. Another possible interpretation could be simply Numenor in this case, who slowly started to expand their influence to over to Middle-earth and also to the south. One could of course argue that this is not perfectly fitting time-wise, because the war of Elves and Sauron ended 1700 and in Appendix B of the Lord of the Rings we can read that only about 1800 the Numenorians started to establish dominions on the coast. However, from other texts, for example in Unfinished Tales and also the Akalabes, I guess, we know that some harbors were established much earlier or that at least Tolkien had the idea that these harbors were established earlier. An example would be Lond Dyer and also some other places. So this is always a bit confusing in the timeline of the Second Age, to be completely honest here. Further, I also don't see the need for Numenor to have many harbors to be a threat in the south. They could just have some ships there and explore the land and maybe giving the people knowledge and helping them, this would already cause dissension and disarray among the forces in the south and spread their influence while Sauron was busy being in his disguise and could not really look out for the threat there. And that might also be the reason why Sauron was then at some point surprised by Numenor when he attacked Lindon. If Numenor was already big and established in the south, Sauron probably would have heard about this and found out at some point. But he was completely surprised at the very end of the war of elves and Sauron. So in that context it makes complete sense that Numenor was just slowly building up power and influence in this region in some form and that was simply a threat that Sauron overlooked and had not given sufficient thought. However, this is also just an interpretation. So keep in mind that there are different viewpoints possible here and we don't clearly know what Tolkien exactly means with 
enemies in his back in the east and in the southern land. So I think the east part is pretty clear because we find it referenced so much in the Five Wizards text. And this should give you a very good overview of what is actually written in the books about the Blue Wizards. They are definitely of the Maiar. They are definitely going to the east. That is also happening in all the versions. In some versions they are successful, in some they aren't. In some versions they appear in the third age, in some already in the second age with Glorfindel, which is also a very interesting topic. I also made a lengthy Glorfindel video in case you are interested in that as well. I love the mysteries surrounding these two blue withers, what they might have experienced in the distant south or distant east, which we know barely anything about. It's much fun to just think about what adventures they could have experienced there, what people they might have met there, how people might have reacted to them. Just imagine there is somewhere a Gandalf 2.0 riding on his horse through distant lands, kindling the hearts of people to resist the darkness in the world. Thank you for watching. This already became a very long video again and I hope you people find this remotely interesting. If that is the case, feel free to press the like button and maybe subscribe. And maybe if you are into video games, check the games channel of mine as well. All is linked in the description. Also tell me your interpretations of some of these sections that we discussed today, simply because it's always interesting to see different thoughts and opinions on different passages in the book. Especially with the blue with it, there is, as said, a lot of your own imagination that you can put into this. This video was also something I wanted to make for a long time, but if I would have scripted this, it would have taken forever to make. This way it worked much, much better. And I also tried to go into as much detail as possible on a freestyle video. I hope I succeeded here to some degree. Also huge shout outs and thank you to all the artists who gave me permission to use the artworks here in my videos, here in this case, especially Sara Morello and Ted Naismith with his fantastic Blue Withers artwork, but also Kimberly 80 and Jenny Dolphin and all the others that allowed me to use their works. Much appreciated. Also, huge shout outs and thanks to the fantastic community here, supporting me here with likes, with subscribes, with channel memberships, with, I don't know, Twitch um, subscriptions and all the other things that you do here to support me, especially nice and friendly comments, which I always appreciate. Thank you for that. And as said, if you are into video game stuff, maybe check my gaming content out as well. All is linked in the description. I would say again, thank you for watching and see you people next time. Goodbye.